Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome and greetings to all of you on behalf of the Northeastern Conference Administration. Dr. Daniel Allere as our president and Robert Chandler as our chief financial officer. We're delighted that you have joined us today. Um, we are endeavoring to present to you protocols for your local churches for reopening. We are committed to your safety. We are committed to your, have, your, your health. We want you to have a smooth, effective, systematic uh, reorientation uh, to your, back into your local churches. We have some committed, outstanding professionals who will uh, provide for you information today that you will benefit from in helping you get getting back into your churches. We are thankful for them. We are thankful that they have taken the time to come and make the presentations today. We thank Dr. Andrew Joseph for his uh, leadership in this area. We have asked him to uh, provide and facilitate this process, his task force, including Pastor Laguer and others who are working with him to make sure that we have a smooth transition uh, back into our local churches. Again, we are thankful for your presence this morning and uh, we hope that um, this training, this training will be a benefit to you and that you can be well armed uh, to protect uh, yourselves as well as the congregants in our conference. At this time, I encourage you to bow your heads in prayer as we seek God's presence. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We realize we live in a very serious time. COVID-19 has impacted our lives and affected many. Over 100,000 have lost their lives as a result of COVID-19. And oh God, we continue to pray for your presence and we're thankful for our leaders in our churches who are doing their very best remotely to provide religious services to the congregants, to our, to our members. As we make the transition back into our churches, we pray that you will guide us with the knowledge that we would have obtained and gained through training. And we pray, O oh God, for safety and, and good health. We're thankful for this session that is about to begin. Be with everyone who listens and may he or she learn something that will of benefit in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Northeastern. We are delighted that you are on for level two training in how to open up our churches in this COVID-19 pandemic that we have been experiencing. Last week, we offered level one training. We had professionals, Dr. Bizarro, Dr. Alexander, Sister Barbara Hall, Pastor Eddie Leguer, myself, and we gave you some information which was level one to help you reopen up your churches. Today, we are providing level two training. And level two training, uh, we, we, we were looking to get the best fit, the best company to help us with this. And Pastor again, myself, I've been searching out throughout New York. Uh, we, we looked at several different companies, but we sat on this one that you have today, uh, the TC. COVID-19 Facility Decontamination and Response Service. Uh, Brian Freeman is founder and director of this uh, company and they are based out in Long Island, New York. And they provide service throughout New York. Now, it's interesting to know that this company uh, also fought the SARS virus. So they are coming to us well experienced and equipped and ready to help us open up our churches. Brian and TC COVID not only do deep cleaning, but they also undertake what we know as decontamination. As a matter of fact, this past Friday, they were able to go and decontaminate the Beth Elohim Church. Beth Elohim had a meeting yesterday. They wanted to open up for that meeting, and we asked them to go and and do a test run on that church, and, and Pastor Caleb Pierre and his members are happy with the service that uh, uh, Brian and his team provided. So Brian, 
I want to welcome you uh, this morning to Northeastern Conference and your company as you share with us how we can be equipped and prepared to open up our churches effectively and safe. Thank you, Dr. Along with Brian, we have, we have Ruth West. Ruth works with Brian, and Ruth comes to us well experienced as well. She is uh, 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 an RN, she has a gift in, in medicine, and, and she comes with years and years of experience uh, in, in, in health and safety. As a matter of fact, just a little snippet, Ruth uh, was a former director of regulatory compliance for Healthcare Compliance Group, LLC. And her responsibilities included uh, consulting services in all areas of federal and state regulations. Ruth was regulatory compliance consultant for Healthcare Compliance Group for seven years and worked also for 10 years with Greater New York Healthcare Facilities Association, where she was director of regulatory compliance. She had written numerous articles on Long Island, team care, including American College of Healthcare Administrators, and also has been nationally published for her contribution to the Long-Term Care Guide, published by uh, Eli Lilly, as well as a chapter on the survey process and legal and medical ethical long-term care. So Ruth is a disease preventionist, and we are happy this morning to welcome uh, Brian and Ruth, TC COVID-19 facility decontamination, as they come and help us with level two training as to how we can better and effectively and safely reopen up our churches. So Ruth and Brian, welcome to Northeastern Conference. Now is your time to speak to our peoples throughout this great field. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Well, first of all, I wanna say that I am very humbled and honored to be part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and just to be with other congregants and other worshipers because it's been a long time since we've been inside our sacred homes and I, I can't even tell you how how really amazed I am at, at everything that's been going on with COVID as an infection preventionist for many, many years. And just to have the honor of trying to teach a group about how to stay safe in our own churches is, is really quite humbling. But we're all covered by the blood of the lamb and that gives us the safety and the confidence we need to get back into our churches. But there has to be accountability and responsibility. And those are the two words that are so incredibly important to me as an educator for all these years, especially on infection control, which is really the key area that we're gonna talk about a little bit today before Brian speaks about the decontamination. Just to tell you a little bit about my role in Teen Challenge, uh, my son was a graduate of uh, the Teen Challenge program and is now the director of the program. So it's really amazing that what God can do, and he can certainly take us through this storm of COVID. Just so people understand the word COVID, it just means coronavirus infectious disease. So there's been many different types of coronavirus because viruses mutate. And it's really important that we understand what COVID-19 is really the most uh, aggressive virus I've ever seen in my entire life. And I've been around a long time, but I, I'm very happy to be here. And I, I'm just very proud of what God has done in the lives of so many people. So if you could just go to the PowerPoint, I'm gonna talk a little bit about your responsibilities in the church as congregants. So uh, the next slide, please. First of all, I wanna praise God. I, I am a woman of great faith and I just wanna thank God. I, I can't, there's not enough words to thank God for keeping us safe and COVID free. And many of you who may be listening that recovered from the virus, we know that even if it was the end time for us, that we have a better place to go to. And But we wanna be able to congregate together. We wanna to be able to worship together and we wanna really be safe in our churches in the most sacred place where we can feel the Holy Spirit among us. And I know I for one have missed that so very much. So I'm looking forward myself to going back to church. So may God bless all of you and that are listening. So what are you going to see that's different inside your church? And there should be quite a lot that is different inside the church. 
And one of the things I want to tell you about is that you have a huge responsibility when you enter your church. There should be posters that we could download, and I know Brian said he would send them to Dr. Joseph. Uh, posters from CDC are just incredible, and of course they're 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 very colorful and and they remind you to follow the guidelines for preventing disease transmission. It will be your responsibility as congregants and as people of faith to prevent the transmission of, of viruses and other infectious diseases. But now we have a, a new focus and, and, and I for one am really celebrating that focus because I've been talking about infection prevention and infection control to a lot of people for many years and people just didn't take it seriously. COVID really opened the eyes of many people. So it is our responsibility as congregants, as people of God, to prevent disease to our fellow congregants. There's gonna be new guidelines for seating. So you may not be able to sit next to your bestie that you always sat next to before. And I know how territorial we are in our churches. I usually sit in the same little spot also, because uh, now there will be social distancing and we need to do that uh, special seating and social distancing and limiting the number of people that can come in to any given service for appropriate infection control and prevention. And to tell you the truth, you are the ones that are gonna make the difference. The next slide, please. So one of your key responsibilities and accountability as a congregant and as a, a church member is that you understand this simple little sentence here, that sanitizing and disinfecting the church, which Brian is going to talk to you about extensively. And while that sanitation and disinfecting is going on in the church offices, the classrooms, that may be critical for COVID-19 COVID transmission prevention and killing any virus that may be around. However, without your cooperation, responsibility and accountability, the sanitation is never gonna be enough. And I say that humbly because as a uh, regulatory compliance consultant, I go into nursing homes, that is my business. And I know that everybody has heard on the press uh, how nursing homes, because of the congregant living how many uh, residents unfortunately passed away very quickly and very rapidly, mostly in the month of uh, late March and April, where we where I saw in my area uh, so many deaths and uh, it was it, it was just ex extremely unbelievable. So sanitation, obviously number one, and disinfecting, but without our cooperation in the church in our sacred place of worship, it's it's not going to be enough. So we need to know what to do and we need to know how to do it. So the next slide, please. So here are some of your responsibilities and you may want to take notes or get copies of the PowerPoint or you could always email me or call me. So COVID, which I told you is the coronavirus infectious disease, 19 is because that was the year it was discovered, 2019. It's spread via contact and droplet contamination. So anything you touch is considered contact. So the familiar items that you touch all the time, the chairs, the pew, the doorknobs, uh, in the bathroom, the mirrors, the sink, uh, all, all the other things that you may touch uh, where you're going to a bookcase or you're in an office or you're just touching a desktop. Anything that, that's considered a common vehicle is that you're in contact with can spread this disease. And also droplet is because the virus is aerolized. That means when I cough, when I sneeze, when I talk, when I pray, when I just breathe, just like I'm breathing right now, I can be, if I'm ill, and I have uh, the COVID-19 virus, I could be spreading it. And those droplets, uh, they aerolize, they stay in the air, and then they precipitate onto the contact sources. And that's what Brian will be uh, decontaminating. So that person that may be, uh, it, you may be in contact with and you think is negative can spread the virus. And I, I say this humbly with all my professionalism because of what I've seen in my facilities as the infection preventionist for those facilities, that there have been many, many, many people that are totally asymptomatic, no symptoms of COVID whatsoever, no cough, no respiratory disease, none of the symptoms, but yet they spread it because people aren't aware that uh, they think everyone has to be sick, but yet viruses affect people very differently. And some people get extremely ill and some people just have been tested positive for the virus and never had any symptoms. So uh, you need to be aware and be weary of all people. That's why we're putting in these responsibilities and these infection control procedures so that we know that you're gonna be safe to worship together. So as I said, the virus can be spread, coughing, sneezing, laughing, singing, and we all wanna sing together and praise the Lord together. And that is a very 
important part of welcoming the Holy Spirit in that we sing praises to the Lord and just breathing. And just so you know, and of course you've got this by now that uh, you've heard all the press and all the talk on, on the news that the virus is spread via close contact with a positive person and easily can be transmitted from shaking hands, hugging, kissing, laying of hands in prayer, or just greeting one another. So the next slide, please. So what are we gonna do? Well, the first thing I wanted to tell you is that testing is absolutely critical. It is so important to know if you're positive or negative. In fact, even with the flu season coming upon us in September and October and the fall, the most important thing I tell all of my facilities is the minute you see somebody with any symptoms, they should be tested for the virus. It's the same thing with COVID. That was the missing component. And I mean this with all sincerity, and I've spoken to many groups about this, is that the testing was too little too late. So it's not too late though for us now, as we enter our churches back again, that it's important to take that accountability and responsibility for your own health to get a PCR nasal swab. I know it goes down your nose, but it, it's really not that uncomfortable, but it will tell you if you're positive. If you are positive, stay home because the virus, the uh, you know, you want to stay home at least 10 days. And if you develop symptoms, obviously you want to be seen by a physician. And then the, the next few days, if you're without uh, any fever or without the need for Tylenol or any symptoms, then obviously most likely you have antibodies to the virus and you can come out again. So you should quarantine yourself if you're positive. That's very important because if you are positive, you could be spreading the virus even without any symptoms. If you have not been tested but feel ill, for example, you have any respiratory symptoms such as a cough or congestion, a temperature, it may not be the COVID virus, but you certainly don't want to transmit any infections to your fellow congregants, so you want to stay home. And I, I just, I mean that sincerely. We all want to get back to church, but we all want to be safe when we're in the house of the Lord. The next slide, please. So what are we going to do? Here are some of the uh, responsibilities of the congregants. Once you enter the church, you need to respect all the transmission prevention interventions that are so highly respected by Dr. Joseph and, and this group and the Seventh-day Adventist churches because they wanna keep you safe. So the first thing you have to do, because the number one prevention in all of infection control is always been and always will be hand hygiene because of touching. So hand hygiene on entry with a 60% alcohol gel or foam should be done the minute you enter the church. I just wanna mention something. I know a lot of people I've been around for a long time in the food stores, in my facilities, about glove wearing, latex or, or uh, vinyl gloves. I've seen people wash their hands with the alcohol gel, gel with gloves on. Please don't do that. Hand hygiene is really should be in, with bare hands. I do not believe in the gloves meant unless you're a healthcare professional because you don't know necessarily how to use them. You may wear the gloves all, all the time. It's not a good idea. So hand hygiene frequently and especially on entry to the church is extremely important. That's your number one thing. You also are gonna to need to wear a mask. I know a lot of people are very uncomfortable with a mask, especially elderly people that may have asthma or, or uh, COPD or heart disease. They feel like they can't breathe. If your church is adequately ventilated, you'll be okay. And you have to understand that you're in the church of, of, of the Lord. You're going to be with the Holy Spirit. You'll be protected. If you do not have a mask, you need to use a cloth covering, a bandana, a, a scarf, and I would recommend that the churches have some uh, access to masks. So if, if you're one of the congregants come in and they do not have one, they will be offered one. It's so important because as we talked about, the virus is spread through droplets. So that comes from our breathing and talking and laughing and we wanna protect ourselves and our fellow congregants. By the way, a child under two years of age should not be wearing a mask. I know a lot of little kids that I've seen think it's fun and uh, they wanna wear it but it, it's just, it's not good for uh, for a small child. And make sure if, again, if your children are ill, especially a small child that may have a runny nose and we know how kids touch their faces, rub their noses, it may be a, a, a source of transmission. So you wanna make sure that you're really careful with children that may be ill. So we gotta practice the social distancing at least six feet apart during seating. So we can acknowledge each other in prayer and, and we can certainly still sing with a mask on, we can certainly still pray with a mask on, but we really need to have that social distancing. So there should be some type of uh, arrangement within the church that uh, makes that social distancing appropriate. 
And I would advise you to not have had, you haven't seen each other in a long time. And I know perhaps you've spoken on the phone or, or did Zooms or FaceTime, but once we're all together in church, you don't want to do handshakes, hugging, laying of hands, kissing. And you know, I, I feel very close to most of the congregants I've known, my friends, my dear sisters and brothers in the Lord, and, and I'm a touchy feely person. I want to hug and kiss them, but I know that that would not be a wise thing to do. If you use the restroom during service, please make sure you wash your hands with soap and water at least 25 seconds, making sure you get in between and you should have paper towels, not a cloth towel to wash your hands with. You would shut the water off with the paper towel. That is the appropriate infection control thing to do. And then when you come out, if you're in the entryway, you could use the alcohol gel again. The next slide. This is so important because when leaving the service, okay, so you practiced all of those responsible and accountable uh, modalities. But then when you leave the service, everybody kind of congregates and gets together. So I think that in order to affect appropriate infection prevention, congregants should exit in phases. And that's gonna be up to your different pastors. In other words, row one and row one and two can leave, row however you do it, because all churches are configured somewhat differently. Some churches have multiple exits to get out into the parking lots, the very huge churches, it may take time to leave, but I really believe that you should have some type of a plan. And if you write up that plan, pastors, or you need help, you could just email me and I'll, I'll help you do that or, or phrase it appropriately, because we wanna make sure that we're all safe in entry and in exit. We don't want to have any crowding. So you don't wanna mix with other congregants when you get outside, out going, just go directly to your car. You don't want to, oh, I, I haven't seen Joe in a long time. Let me give him a hug. Let me pray with him. Please do not remove your face mask until you get to your car. Or if you uh, unfortunately have to take a bus or a, a subway or whatever, you wanna keep your face mask on. You should be traveling with little miniature hand sanitizers. You can get them. They're not uh, extinct now. They were in the beginning. A small little one you could get from Amazon or even in your local CVS or Walgreens. And you want to certainly uh, disinfect your hands again after leaving the church. And of course, practice social distancing outside of the church and church grounds at all time because we want to go back next Sunday healthy. We want to go back and, and praise the Lord again. So I want you to be respectful of space and others all the time. The next slide, I think, is the last slide. This is just a little saying for you and, and just a reminder that infection prevention is in your hands. You know, we are, the hands are so important in faith. We use our hands to pray. We lift our hands to the Lord. Well, guess what? God is covering us. And this is a wake up call of revival for all the churches and for all people that praise and believe in Jesus. But I want you to re never forget that infection prevention and infection control is in your hands. If you need any help or you want to just email me a question, uh, it's uh, it's at the front of the PowerPoint, ruthwest1010 at gmail.com. I thank you profoundly for listening. And I know that together we can enjoy our church services again and praise the Lord together because we certainly do need prayer in our country. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Brian. And thank you so much, Dr. Joseph, for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Sister Ruth. Greatly appreciate it. Very thorough. So one of the things that, that I'm going to talk about is the actual decontamination process. I know Dr. Joseph was very um, adamant about making sure that the information that went out to the congregants was going to be something that was able to that they were able to learn and also able to teach. So uh, if you'll go to the first slide, which is considerations for communities of faith. Okay. Uh, what you see on your screen now is the actual uh, trifold of our ministry. And uh, what I'm going to do is, is we'll get back to that at the end just to let you know what we're all about. I want to go through the considerations for community of faith slide. You know. So gathering together for worship um, is the center of what it means to be a community of faith. Um, but it does present a risk, as you know. Um, you know, the first problem that ever came into this world was isolation. God said it is not good for man to be alone. So what we understand is happening right now is that the, the, the communities of faith, we're designed for community and we want to make sure that we're good stewards over the opportunity that God has given us to be a part of a community uh, because that's our original design. We were designed to live in community. That is where our help is. So we're gonna go a little bit more in depth about, about what to do and the different um, um, tactics that you can use to clean and approach uh, disinfecting. 
Uh, one of the things that communities of faith need to do is they need to make sure that they have someone who is trained in understanding the uh, procedures that uh, need to be enacted if someone is sick or if someone does need help, um, if there is an emergency in your church because things happen outside of COVID, how would we operate with that? Who's gonna be the contact person? Who we're gonna call um, to, to, to handle the situation? And what we're gonna do with the congregants in there is in case the rescue squad or someone had to come to help someone who had an Ill illness. Another thing that I make that, that, uh, that you may want to consider is, um, and you're going to see this more and more in the public eye, is we have these these um, laser thermometers, and what we do with these thermometers is we uh, just press and point, and it, it, it point on the forehead of a person who's coming in the church, and it will let you know if they have a fever. Of course, having a fever isn't the only symptom, but it will give you a clue if someone's not doing well and it's just another level of accountability. Just to let you know, my personal um, experience with uh, COVID is I, I actually had it back in February of this year and it was very, very tough on me and I'm a, a, a fairly young man and it was very hard. So I know that had I not been in good health, things probably could have been a lot worse. It was very difficult, fever, um, I didn't have the respiratory issues. Um, but what it what it did, I took that time to really learn about this disease because I have a uh, I'm, I'm mad at the COVID-19. I'm mad at the enemy for what, what's happening. And so I have a vested interest in making sure that no one else has to go through what I went through. It was an attack on my family, my wife, my mother, my father, who also live in, who live in Virginia. And it was very difficult for us. So let's talk about promoting healthy hygiene practices. Um, you need to encourage your staff to maintain good hand hygiene. Um, as Ms. Roof already said, I don't want to be redundant uh, with, the, with how she explained it, but it, you, you cannot stress it enough. Um, hand sanitizer is good on your hands, but it's not something that's good to be used on hard surfaces because the alcohol will evaporate before uh, the time frame of the virus, uh, th that the virus needs to be killed. Um, it works on your hands because your hands are porous and the alcohol will stay in your pores and, and do the job, but it will not work on a hard surface. Um, so if you think that you're, hand, that you're sanitizing a surface by putting alcohol sanitizer on it, that is not necessarily the case because of the time of the evaporation. We need to make sure that we encourage our staff to wear masks once again. Um, um, they are designed to, to, to help the wearer if the person is affected or asymptomatic. And again, if the child is under two years old, you do not want to um, have that child using a mask because of breathing issues. Next slide, please. So cleaning and disinfecting frequently um, is, is the key. Um, one of the things that, that came to my mind as I started thinking about churches and congregants is the, uh, the, the worship team. Um, their, the microphone covers, the sponges that go over the microphones should be changed. Um, you, should, you should buy them, they're not very expensive, um, and I would get rid of them after every, uh, every, every use and make sure that you sanitize the actual microphone. Um, it talks about ensuring safe and correct application of disinfectants. Um, I'm gonna give you a little information about what we use. Um, a lot of the disinfectants that are out here today are, are clearly marked as to what they will um, be able to kill. And your goal and your job would be to just simply make sure that you um, have the right dilution. If it, if it needs to be diluted, make sure that you uh, do that appropriately so you're effectively killing the virus. It's not necessarily, uh, well, it's not recommended that you put more of the chemical in it. It does not uh, it does not work any better if you if you add extra to it. You're actually creating a problem, maybe for your skin or maybe damaging a surface if your if your if your chemical is too strong. Um, it also affects the the uh, ventilation of the chemical if you make it too strong. Um, one of the things we want to talk about is making sure that there's proper ventilation when you're using disinfectants to prevent inhalation and toxic fumes. Um, it's very important that we are aware that that prevention. Um, is, is necessary, but sometimes uh, the way that we go about the prevention can create another problem. Uh, when you're using, uh, we, we, we have uh, machines that actually fog, and um, those machines uh, will, will definitely clean the air, 
Um, but you need to make sure that your church is well ventilated. Um, you want to make sure that you have um, if you if you have uh, windows that you can open them up during that ventilation time to make sure that the, 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 that the church is clear and that there's no chemical in the air because it can it can be irritating if you breathe it. If your church offers multiple services, um, you should want to make your services, um, you know, a minimum of an hour. Um, we we are built for for speed, so to speak. We are um, set up and we've invested in the machinery and the equipment that will allow us to disinfect, um, to dry the surfaces and to clean the air within that hour period of time. Um, there is there is definitely. Um, residue that needs to, to clear out of the air and you do not want your congregants coming in sitting on wet surfaces sitting on wet seats or breathing that um, when it comes to uh, uh, that time frame of changing the, the uh, changing from one service to the next you want to make sure that um, everyone is is exiting the building um, so that you have adequate time and that you don't start any type of um, fogging or aerolizing uh, while someone's still in the church. Uh, one, another issue that has arise um, is the, the changing of your air filters in your church. Um, if you have window unit air conditioners, you wanna make sure that you change those filters out. Um, you wanna use a filter that is rated to uh, catch the virus. Um, they, will, they will be able to catch the molecules of the virus and not get them in your ventilation system and allow them to spread through. You want a filter that's going to be able to do that. So you would go to your local store, you would give them the type of uh, unit that you have, and you would ask them to give you a filter that was rated to, to trap the virus. When it comes to water systems and drinking fountains in your churches, um, that I would encourage your churches to bring their own water, your congregants to bring their own water. Um, and the reason is, is that it stops, uh, it's one less thing to, to, to spread. Uh, the virus. Uh, if there is a water fountain or something and, and someone does need a drink, then I would suggest that you have cups available um, and that they use the cup um, and not put their face down at the at the you know standard type water fountain. Um, that would be a must. Next slide, please. Disinfecting frequently. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we, we need to do is we need to take a really good look at what is touched in our church. You know, if you were coming into a church for the first time, you, you know, you would you, you would touch things such as door handles, the back of your chairs. Um, one of the things that, that you need to consider is uh, the Bibles and the, the pamphlets and the things that are in the back of the pews. Um, in most cases, you don't want um, people to, to touch those things. Um, there's different you know, opinions about how long it will live on a surface. But if you're doing it in between service, then, you know, I, I would dare to say that, it, it, that if someone touched the Bible that had the COVID and the next group came right in an hour later uh, and touched that same Bible, I would say they've just, you know, been exposed to the to the disease. So you definitely want to suggest that they bring their own Bibles, maybe even put a um, put put the scripture up on the screen, as most churches do, and they can read along for those who don't have Bibles. You want to make sure you pay attention to all of the doorknobs, electric outlets, lights, chairs, um, you know, anything that um, a, congreg a congregant uh, will come in contact with. The virus, COVID-19 virus, can be killed if you do the proper steps. Uh, one of the things that you need to understand is that if there is dirt on the surface, so there's cleaning and then there's sanitizing and disinfecting. Um, if a surface is, is is dirty and I come in and disinfect it um, or put disinfectant on that surface, I've just put disinfectant over dirt. So you want to make sure that you don't do that because you are um, taking away from the um, the effectiveness of the disinfectant. You want to remove any debris that are there first and then you want to uh, uh, decontaminate. You also want to wear proper PPE. Um, if we can go to the photograph, or it may be later, I'm sure it's later in the PowerPoint, but there is a, there's, there's a proper suit. We wear the PPEs. Uh, there it is on your screen there. That's one of my guys uh, in one of the facilities that we decontaminate. And uh, he has a ventilator on because the chemical that will be sprayed, um, you, you do not want to breathe it in a, in a regular mask that you see everyone wearing will not um, catch the particles, so it would still be, create a problem for breathing. 
so this young man has the ventilator on. He also has, he doesn't have the goggles on, but when we are doing the spraying, we have goggles on as well. Um, these suits are not expensive. Um, I think you can get them for about $7 a piece and the ventilator that he has on is about $6. And then you, uh, you know, it has filters that you add in after every use. And of course you want to spray it with disinfectant and let it air dry after every one so that you can reuse the ventilators. So if you're looking to uh, purchase this, these things, they're not very expensive and um, they should be thrown away after each, after each use. The, the actual suit should be thrown away after each use. The other thing is that you want to make sure that any rags, any, any, uh, anything that you use to clean with, needs to go in a bag, um, a hazmat type bag. Um, we have the hazardous material bags and we would treat it as though it was, you know, hazardous material, it goes in that bag. It's an orange bag um, that we use. And that bag is, 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 anyone who sees that bag knows that there are rags that are in there are rags that were used to decontaminate. And you wanna make sure that they don't uh, reach in there and grab a rag or something like that from that. They need to be washed after every use. Next slide, please. Disinfecting frequently. Sorry, uh, go to what is disinfecting. So soap and water may clean, but disinfecting kills. And as I said before, alcohol sanitizer is good on your hands, but not good on the surfaces. So don't think that you're doing an adequate job to put alcohol sanitizer on a hard surface. Let's go to determining what needs to be disinfected. Carpet deep cleaning is, a, is an issue um, that a lot of churches have brought to me. And I strongly recommend that you get your carpets done um, at the beginning of this new season. Um, you want to go in and uh, you want to disinfect. Uh, you, want to, you want to pull any dirt that's out of your carpet. As I said earlier, you want to remove the dirt and then you want to maintain it. So if you remove the dirt from your carpet and then you have a disinfecting regimen, um, a fogging type treatment like we offer, then you will be able to maintain um, good quality, uh, you know, carpeting and, and disinfecting, especially if you have kids in your church that may be on the floor or something like that. The last thing you want to do is not have a disinfected carpet. So each facility will have different surfaces and objects that frequently are, are touched by multiple people. One of the things that we need to think about um, are things like communion, offering, um, and how we do that. I strongly recommend that, you know, um, instead of passing the basket around the church, I'm not quite sure how you do it. Uh, some churches pass a basket around that you uh, that you don't do that because there's more people touching that surface. So I would suggest that whomever you have uh, ushers or whoever would be collecting your offering, that they would be the only ones touching uh, the baskets. And I would I would uh, I would not want to pass it around. Um, the other thing I don't suggest is that you allow the congregants to, to walk and come up to the front and drop it themselves because now you are risking spreading the virus in more areas of your church. I know some churches will you know, allow row after row to come up and drop an offering at the front and then come back to their seat. Um, we want to limit how much movement we have in our churches. Ideally, what we would like people to do is to come in and, and, and stay in that area that they're in and leave. Um, and that's difficult because we as the body of Christ get excited about the things of God. And I know myself, I like to jump around and, and act a little crazy for Jesus. And so I have to contain myself as well. Um, but it's, it's worth it to be in my father's house. Next slide, please. Um, here is, is, is uh, self-explanatory, different uh, things you may want to uh, keep an eye on as far as making sure that they're clean. Another thing I want to bring up is uh, I, I remember uh, when the um, when my daughter was born, I remember someone told me, OK, you have to, when she started walking, you have to get down on her level and you have to look at the things that she will touch. You have to baby proof your home. Um, and so if you do have kids in your congregation, you may want to consider uh, you know, that as well, knowing that, yes, as an adult, we will touch things that are, you know, at a higher, high, at a different level than what a, a child would. But we also want to make sure that we don't just stick to uh, decontaminating the top of things because, you know, the virus can be, you know, spread by children and children touch things at a lower place. Next screen, please. 
So I want to talk a little bit about what we do, and um, and and I feel like it's a it's a good uh, opportunity for you guys to maybe model after it. Um, we are here for you uh, if you need help um, with training and things like that. Um, we're more than willing to help you out. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about what we provide because this is going to be um, in line with what the CDC is asking. So we definitely provide deep cleaning of hard and soft surfaces, carpeting and things like that, sanitizing, disinfecting, cleaning carpets and restroom sanitation. Of course, restrooms need to be uh, sanitized thoroughly. Um, you must remove dirt and debris um, and you must do your uh, decontamination um, after that. Next slide, please. So I've given you a, a picture of a, the chemical that we use. It's called Midquat, and it is rated to kill COVID-19. Uh, one thing that you want to do, and this is important in case the CDC or uh, the EPA or someone comes in to spot check your church, is you want to make sure that you have labels available and that they're on the bottles of the equipment that you're of, of the, um, the spray that you're using. Um, just having a spray with liquid in it and spraying it on something isn't enough. It needs to be labeled. Um, there is a dilution process to this particular chemical that we use. Um, it's not the chemical that you must use because there are a lot of chemicals out here that will kill COVID. But we found that this one works best uh, for us and, and we're able to, to make uh, the solution um, in squirt bottles and to do it in our fogging machines. Labels must be displayed. That's important. Next slide, thank you. So coveralls, ventilators, gloves, goggles, all of these things should be worn. Um, if you have volunteers or church members that are, 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 are going to help you out, you want to make sure that they are trained on how to do this, what to do with the uh, equipment once they're done with it, how to make sure that it's clean, um, how to make sure that they, uh, they have everything disposed and treated as hazmat material. Next slide, please. So again, we have the picture of one of my guys. This is a, a, a suit that we have. Um, you know, we buy we buy in bulk because we do a lot of decontamination. Um, I'm sure the more you buy, the cheaper the price, uh, but they're not very expensive. And if you're going to have volunteers, then they should have something on like this. As you see, we have a group of four to six representatives coming to your facility. Um, and in most cases, the guys will come. They'll all be suited up. In most cases, they'll come before um, before service. Um, a big part of what we do and a big part of our, our thought process behind this uh, decontamination business was how is it will the church be able to have the sanctuary safe and ready and clear of chemical um, before the next service? So. We have drying machines. Um, if you can play the, the video, um, this, this is just an example of us in one of our properties. We were just uh, uh, spraying there um, that fogging uh, that we have going over all of the um, the furniture to make sure that it's uh, it's it's been covered. And that was just a brief tutorial. And this is in an actual church where we actually have a machine that we're putting on the seat. So after we have sprayed everything down, the chemical needs to set for 10 minutes. Once the chemical sets for 10 minutes, it has done its job. And once that happens, then I'll have the guys come in uh, with the machines and they will dry to make sure everything's dry. Um, you also need to make sure that you have your 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 fans or your, your drying machines on your hard surfaces as well. Um, the, the chemical, when you put it down in a fog or mist, um, if you have hard floors, tile floors in your building, in your lobby area, um, it becomes an ice skating ring. So you definitely want to make sure that you have um, the proper mops uh, to, to dry, the proper machines to dry it, because the last thing you want is, to, is for someone to walk into your church and slip and fall. Um, wet floor signs are a must. Um, when we are doing um, our uh, um, decontamination, we have the doors and things open. We suggest that as a church comes in that the doors are open so no one has to touch any doorknobs and we suggest when they leave that the doors are open. We will leave the doors open. We will put caution tape off to make sure that no one comes in while we're fogging and we the, the pastors have done a great job of explaining to the congregants that you know they need to exit as soon as the service is over so that we have um, uh, 
plenty of time to clean and, and disinfect the church and get everything aired out. We do not want people breathing those chemicals. Um, you need to develop a, a log uh, book of what you have disinfected and when it was done. What we do is we issue a certificate after every cleaning um, and along with a binder. So I would give you a binder um, which, which has the chemical that is used, um, the procedure and what we've done based on what the CDC guidelines tell us that we need to do to clean appropriately. Um, we will have a checkoff uh, list set up that will stay at your church. If we were coming on a um, monthly basis, then every time we would come in, you would give us the binder. We would put a new certificate in for that week, seeing that your church has been decontaminated. And then you would uh, we would sign off on the logbook. Um, this is how we do it so that if anyone ever comes to your church and wants to know what you're doing to prevent the spread, you can give them that binder and it has all of your certificates for your weekly um, uh, decontamination and also has your, uh, your information about signing off on the different areas that were done. I strongly suggest that you uh, keep the areas of your church that are not going to be used uh, off limits. Keep them locked. If, if you have a, the ability to lock it off, please do so. Um, it, you just, if you're not going to use the area, you just don't want people going in it. And so uh, a lot of uh, churches aren't offering uh, children's ministry uh, yet because of, of the danger of exposure. So those, those rooms, you know, will stay locked um, so that no one goes in those rooms. And that's very important. And I want to thank you. That's going to be um, uh, my portion of this. We do want to offer it up, offer up an opportunity for any questions that you may have. Uh, we can do a time of q and I'm very thankful for this. I'm very thankful for the Seventh Day Adventist Church uh, family for uh, contacting us and asking us to help with this. It was it was a very exciting opportunity. I'm available for calls. My number's there. This information that we've just went over will also be available for you. In addition to, um, as Ms. Ruth said earlier, any signs that you need, you should have signs in your church giving people instruction. Um, so we, we are here for you. If you need us, please contact us. Um, don't hesitate. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much, Ruth, for your informative uh, presentations. We got a few questions. We got a few questions for you. That's coming up now, and uh, we'll try to give them to you. You respond. I think one that's critical here is there are individuals with allergic reactions to alcohol, and uh, I guess I'm seeing only part of the question. What? You know, are the CDC's guidelines regarding that for individuals and even members who might have allergic reactions to these chemicals? Okay, uh, there, you, and you're absolutely right. There are a lot of people that are allergic to uh, things with alcohol in it. In that case, you're going to need to wash your hands with regular soap and water. There are uh, at least for 25 seconds. But you, the minute you enter the church, you may want to use. Uh, there are baby wipes and disinfectant wipes that do not contain alcohol that you can use. They may not be as effective. CDC says 60% alcohol is the best, but the constant hand hygiene would be the answer to that question. I would not uh, recommend that that congregant wear gloves. People think that they're protected by the latex and the vinyl gloves. It's, it's not necessarily true. It actually becomes a, a target for transmission. So hand washing with regular soap and water is, is an excellent way to remove all all germs, bacteria, viruses. That that would be my answer. Or a disinfectant wipe that does not contain alcohol. Okay, thank you. Uh, I believe this one is one for you, um, Brian. Can the fogger be used on electronics? That is microphones and keyboards and sound equipment. For you, Brian. Sure. Good question. Um, we, when we come in, the first thing we do is cover all electronics um, because we do not want the, the particles to get into electronics. So the answer would be no. You don't want to use a fogger on your electronics. What you want to do is spray a rag and wipe those electronics down. Uh, you do not want to allow those uh, chemicals, because they're very fine the way they're dispersed, to get into your keyboard or your computer um, or your microphone and things like that. So we, we our first job is to cover uh, those uh, 
those items to make sure that we don't have any issues. Good question. Okay. Another question. Should we should we spray the basket of em envelopes before the counters count? If so, how long should the spray sit before touching? That's the offering envelopes. Should you spray the envelopes? Is that should we spray yes, them? Yes. Before the yes. And what what are you spraying them with? Lysol? What are you spraying them yeah, with? Day one. That's a question. You have to guide them if it could be sprayed, and if so, what chemicals to use? Okay. Well, you can just do a little mist of Lysol spray. That might, that might just do it in the air, and it will automatically. I would not spray directly onto envelopes. It's going to moisten it and make it wet. But you could just spray a little Lysol a disinfectant spray. It will kill the COVID virus into the air, uh, and then handle the envelopes. Or you may want to encourage congregants to give online. Or when they, uh, or just necessarily put in a in a Ziploc bag. You may have a Ziploc bag in your offering basket at the entrance or the exit of the church, wherever you want, and they can put the envelope directly into that. That will also safeguard it. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, obviously, we need the revenue to build our church. And I also want to say that uh, as far as the electronic equipment, there are uh, an an antimicrobial wipes that will kill. The virus to that and there's also antimicrobial hand wipes that you can have at the entrance to the church for people to use pdi is a company that makes them they're pretty good but um i would not spray directly any envelopes there's no evidence that uh the the virus is going to really uh be on those envelopes for any length of time if a person is using hand hygiene and then taking an envelope and putting it into a basket the basket would have to be contaminated for the whole for all of the envelopes to be contaminated. So um, if you if you feel not confident in, in handling those envelopes, I would use Lysol, the Lysol spray. Okay, another question here. Yeah. What type of spray? You want to comment, Brian? Right ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, for the purposes of counting, uh, offering, and money, I. Um, and, and I know Ms. Rook has said, you know, gloves are not a good, a good, a good thing. And the reason is, is because because gloves need to be changed often and frequently. Right. So if if um, you are going to count, you know, you would put gloves on for that period of time, and then immediately once you're done with your counting and your sealing of your your packages, um, you would you would take the gloves off. I agree with that. It's the changing of the gloves that congregants don't. Not all congregants understand, but for a particular task, absolutely, you're right. Okay, here's another question. Um, what type of solutions can be used for disinfecting and sanitizing hard surfaces? Okay, so I gave you uh, one that's on the market, the one that we use, and that's uh, our research has found that that was, uh, was, was, a, was a really good one to do both. Um, but there are others that will also kill, and, and maybe Ms. Ruth can give you some names of others. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with quite a few, so um, that, that's, a, that's a, 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 something that you could find out really easily just by uh, checking with your local uh, uh, supply store uh, and asking them what, what, what chemicals are they using. Well, I'd like to add to that that you can go to cdc.gov or just go do a Google search, EPA, uh, approved disinfectants and you're going to be shocked. In fact, we could send you that list yes. if you need it, Dr. Joseph, of all yes. the disinfectants. Because I know a lot of people have always asked me at, when I'm out in the field, what can I use at home, Ruth? Because I always recommend bleach. Uh, so, uh, bleach cleaners. Bleach kills everything. It kills HIV. It certainly kills most viruses. But there wasn't too much information about bleach killing COVID. If you maintain a, a, cle a cleanly home, most likely you're not going to have growth of virus. But you must use an EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, product, and that's extremely important. Ly Lysol is an environmental protected, uh, protected agency product. There's Lysol you can buy right over in the supermarket and dilute it and use it or use the spray. So that, that would be my answer for that. Okay, Ruth um, uh, and Brian, there's a question here, which really is one, I believe, for us, but you could give a, a response. Uh, someone is asking, um, what advice do you have to give to a church that does not comply with with the recommendations that you, you all have given and what we gave last week? What, what counsel do you have to give to such a church? 
I'd like sure. to start, Brian, and then you sure. can finish up. Sure. Uh, I've been a registered nurse for 47 years, and I've been an infection preventionist for almost all of that time. First 15 years in the hospital and the rest of my career in nursing homes. The number one, the number one thing to prevent the spread of disease and infections is sanitation and disinfection. If you're not disinfecting and sanitizing your church, and I'm not talking about routine cleaning, with a virus as aggressive as COVID, you're going to have transmission. So uh, we, and again, like I said in my short little PowerPoint presentation, we have to be responsible and accountable ourselves for following those steps and, and just respecting our leadership in all of the new rules and regulations of entering and exiting our house of worship. So uh, I would strongly recommend that everyone understand that they really need to disinfect and sanitize the church, not just clean the church. And you may want to add to that, Brian. And, and he did such an excellent job. I'm so proud of you. He did such an excellent Thank job. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it, we just don't have the opportunity to not be diligent anymore. Um, I think that the world we live in has changed. And I, um, I predict in the future, we're probably going to see more of more uh, accountability for people who are being reckless with um, these type of gatherings and not having those things in place. There are requirements uh, for each phase. Uh, they are letting uh, uh, here in New York, the uh, I, I believe it's 50% uh, in phase four. Um, so that if that's the case, um, then you know, there are going to be requirements that are going to have to be followed. The, you do not want the CDC to get a report that you're not doing that because they will shut you down. And they are not playing about that. And, and I do feel as though this thing was attack, an attack on the faith-based community. And if the faith-based community is not doing a good job with making sure that we maintain our churches, then we're going to be used as an example as to why they justified not allowing us to open and why they justified not allowing us to gather. So you don't want to be in a situation or be the church that gets closed down because it's going to be an example. It's going to be an embarrassing opportunity for the ministry. And it doesn't speak to the excellent spirit that Christ has told us we all have. Amen. Well, there were many right. examples uh, that were seen on uh, in the press where there were uh, gatherings that did not practice social distancing, did not practice wearing masks. Uh, and there were religious groups like the Orthodox communities in Brooklyn, and then there were some other groups, and they had mass uh, uh, gatherings, and then there was massive positive cases and people that yes. were extremely ill. Yes. So yes. we, we want to be respectful because we want to praise and worship the Lord together, but we don't want to be sick. So we don't want to be the person that was responsible and accountable for transmitting virus because, oh, that's not true about that COVID. I don't need to wash my hands. I don't need to worry about disinfecting. I don't need I, my vacuuming and, and wiping of the hard surfaces is enough. It's not. Sanitizing and disinfecting is very different than just routine cleaning. All right. Very well. Another question. And we have several. I have to pick out which ones are critical to you because some questions are relevant to last week's presentation. So I'm taking the ones that relate to your presentation today. So here's one for you. How should bathrooms be sanitized after each use during service? Okay, so I can answer that. Uh, what you want to do is you want to have a, um, a volunteer um, that is responsible for that. Um, what we do at our facility, which we have 150 people on our facility, and when we have people coming in to do, uh, we just had a family day, to assign someone to the, the restroom and they're, they're let in with a key and they're let, once they come out, that employee will go in and sanitize that bathroom after each use. If you have, uh, it, it may create a problem depending on the size of your church. Um, if you allow, you know, if you have the ability to allow more than one person to go into the restroom at one time, then do that. Um, but then after they come out, you need to make sure that you go and sanitize afterwards. Well, these are some of the things that should be on a, a, an instruction sheet or just, you know, a guideline for sa for safety. Uh, and that I just recommend that before you open your churches, that all of your congregants get a list of those uh, new instructions so that they're familiar with them. Because when they don't understand what to do, then there'll be conflict. Mm -hmm. All right. Another question here. With fabric covered pews and chairs, 
how long will it take for it to dry and the chemicals to wear off for the next group to enter? Okay, so um, um, as I said earlier, uh, we have a system in doing that. What we do is we spray the chemical. It has to sit at least 10 minutes to sort of air dry. Uh, once it's once it sits for 10 minutes, then we will speed up the drying process uh, with our machines to make sure that they're dry. Now, the fogging machines that we use, they don't saturate. So you're not dealing with uh, a very uh, wet surface. You're dealing with a slightly moist surface once that surface has once that chemical has, has contacted that surface and has sit there for 10 minutes then we will come and speed the drying process up from that point okay um there's a question regarding air conditioning and brian you talked about changing the filters all right yes sir uh but there's someone here who wants to know if we sh should use the air conditioning at all, and if we use them, should the windows be open with the AC, and should we use air purifiers? You know, that's a question that someone sent in to you. Um, I say yes to everything. <laughs> I say um, you want to, you want to, you want to. Of course, you want it to be comfortable in your church. Um, if you have the ability to, to keep circulation, keep windows open during that time, um, do that. If you have fans, if you have air purifiers, I don't think you can do too much right now. I think that you want to you want to do whatever you can. If you have the luxury to be able to have these things to help clean the air, um, you, you just need to make sure that the, the filters that you're using are filters that are rated for CDC, uh, that are rated by the CDC to be able to catch the, the, the microbes of the virus. One of the things that all churches should do with their air conditioning is make sure that they're changing the fill. If it's a, um, a window unit, they have to change the filter and use a HEPA filter and make sure that they the, all of the filters are clean because especially if they haven't been used in a long period of time. And if it's central air, you should definitely have your uh, HVAC man come and service your air conditioner beforehand because the ducts yes. have residue in them. Yes. So they need to be okay. vacuumed out. Okay, Sylvia, I believe this is a question. You touched on it in, in your presentation, but singing is a constant question of every time we have a training. And we touched on it last week already. We, 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 we give directions of that, but the question here again is, should we be singing and that pertains to praise team that sings and through aerosol and the pulpit and the microphones what hard advice could you give to our churches as we seek to open up i'd know? like to address that and and that's an excellent question and your your praise team the people your worship team that does all of the music and it, it's so important as we welcome the holy spirit and, and worship together should be tested and that's why i just had that little slide on testing it's an absolute you must be tested if you're a part of the praise team, a part of, of church services, an elder, and in leadership. I mean, I've had to be tested almost every week in order to be, just to go to work. Uh, I guess many people know that the governor of New York mandated that uh, nursing homes and hospitals we be tested twice a week. Now we're in a, a phase a four here where I live and now we're being tested once a week. Testing is really the key. So why would you let your worship leaders or your leadership in the church not be tested? So once they bring in and that proof, you may start. You can start a binder in your church office, but it shouldn't say, "Oh yeah, I was tested and I'm um, uh, negative." That's not enough. You need to see that validation. It's easy to get. So that would be my recommendation and one of the instructions that you give your congregants. That first of all, you want everybody to be tested, but the the people that are doing the worship, they do not have to wear a mask because they've been tested and they're and they're negative, uh, and. You, you feel comfortable with them. They're far enough away with the social distancing. You've got the proper ventilation, but the people sitting in the pews and in the chairs should be wearing a mask. Okay, uh, very well. Uh, Brian, we, we did talk about, and you will share with me how important it is for us to clean even the pastor's office, the, the secretary's office, and even pens and, and all those little details that we just take for granted even the pen used to, to sign off on the checklist. Now, people are asking this. 
Um, is there going to be a checklist that you can provide for sanitizing the building as we go along? Can you provide a checklist uh, to sure. pay attention to? Absolutely, and, and, and they will all be specific to your building. Um, I design checklists after I come in and see what the need is, and then I design my checklist based on the need. Um, some churches are just focused on the sanctuary um, and not necessarily the offices. Um, but if you are focused on the office, then um, as Ms. Uh, Ruth has taught me so well, you have to consider that it's terminal cleaning. And terminal cleaning means that I would sit down at your desk and I would look at everything that you would touch and I would make sure that I disinfect all those surfaces. Um, pins, your paper clip holder, uh, your stapler, um, I'm, I'm at my desk now looking around at things, you know, if, if there's a, you know, a, a, a book that I could, uh, you know, the outside of the book, maybe um, without, you know, making it too moist. Uh, anything, the drawers on your desk, your file cabinet, um, you want to make sure that you um, you do all of that because term, terminal cleaning mean, means that there is something there that could prevent, that could cause someone to lose their life. So it's a different type of cleaning. Um, and you need to be very specific about how you do that. So, Brian, but how, how can a pastor or, or a church secretary or a staff undertake self-help ongoing sanitizing of these little things like pens and books and, you know, things like those in the office? Sure. So, you know, the first the first part is awareness. And, and um, as you know, Dr. Joseph, uh, understanding what we're dealing with is the key um, to coming up with a plan that will help us to make sure that we're safe. And um, and, I, and and this training is about exactly that. Um, you know, if you as a church leader understand what you're dealing with, then there are things that you can do yourself. If you're asking someone to come and clean your office, then, you know, you take the initiative to clean the areas, the inside of your drawers and things like that, lock them up. So then when someone comes in, they're just cleaning the outside of the surface, but you have to be diligent about protecting yourself. If you're sitting at your desk, you know what you use. Um, you don't want a desk full of stuff when people come in. You want to make sure you clear that so that they're just focused on getting the hard surfaces and things like that. And then, you know, the personal items that you use that you may need, you should you should definitely take the uh, opportunity to, to take care of yourself and exercise self help. And you should always have a supply of disinfecting wipes at your desk. So yeah. you can wipe off your computer screen with that, your pens, all the frequently hard touch areas, they're disinfectant wipes. They're not that expensive. They're really uh, because you're not going to have Brian and his company there uh, every day. So you, we need to be responsible and accountable ourselves for all the little touch surfaces by ha using those disinfecting wipes. And they're really quite good. Very well, Brian. Uh, you covered this, but the question still comes up, and I'll give it again. Should a staff that is assigned to clean the bathroom after each use wear a specific type of PPE? And I know you cover that, but please answer it again for that. Sure, um, absolutely. If your if your assignment in the ministry that day is to be responsible for the bathroom, then I absolutely uh, suggest that whoever that person is has the proper suit on. Um, it, it has it serves a couple purposes. For one, if I see someone standing at a bathroom with a suit on, then I know. That, that I need to, to, to be prepared to follow instruction um, because there is a process that is in, in place. So um, absolutely, you wanna have um, the PPE. You don't necessarily need the ventilator um, at that point if you're not spraying a lot of chemical. Um, remember that the, the bathroom has been decontaminated before um, church and, and you're maintaining. Um, it's always good to, you know, if you have Lysol or you have a chemical that you do want to spray in the air, you want to back out with it so that you're not in the room while the uh, chemical is in the air and you're not breathing it in. So you spray it as you're backing out. That's the last thing you do. Um, the problem with doing it that way is that you got a, a, a person coming in the bathroom right behind it and, and they would be breathing that. So you don't necessarily want to do it in the air so you don't need the ventilators. But if you were to do it that way, you need to make sure you have proper ventilation so that the next person coming in is not breathing all of that chemical in the air. We lost the value.
Okay. I I was told that my my uh, my camera is upside down, but it's up right <laughs> up on my end. So I, I hope that uh, you're hearing me. But this is the yeah. device. I'm looking good on my end, but it seems as though on your end my camera is flipped. So J3, you could if you can help with that, I'd appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, here's another question. Uh, and I know, Ruth, you covered this too. Will bleach suffice as a disinfectant cleaner? You covered that, but again, the question comes up. What was the question? I'm sorry, it's hard to hear you, Dr. Joseph. Will, will bleach suffice as a disinfectant cleaner? I, I absolutely clean everything with bleach in my home. And bleach is an excellent, clean. it does kill viruses. And as many people listening know, COVID is not the only virus. We have hepatitis is a virus, herpes is a virus, influenza is a virus. Um, the ble Clorox sprays and Clorox wipes are really excellent uh, tools to use in your home and you can use them in the bathroom in the church as well. Uh, when you're sanitizing and disinfecting, terminally cleaning, such as some of the things that Brian is doing, you would be using the Minquat and, and all of those uh, a little bit stronger chemicals. But for routine cleaning of the bathroom in between, you can use Clorox. You can use the Clorox foam, the Clorox spray. You can use the Clorox wipes. It's, it's okay. And Lysol also makes wipes. It, they're both EPA uh, acceptable disinfectants. Okay. Uh, there are people who ask the question, and I know the answer is yes. Will this presentation be available? And that's yes. You get it to me, and we get it out to all of the people who attended the training today. All right, let me give you, Ruth and Brian, a few moments just to make some summary st statements. Uh, Brian, I know you are available with your company to come up to churches and do assessments and to do cleaning and, and sanitizing. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you were able to decontaminate the Beth Elohim Seventh Adventist Church in Brooklyn on this past Friday. And you mentioned that you are all from New York, which includes Western New York, Syracuse, uh, Buffalo, Rochester. You're all over New York. We are looking for a counterpart to help with our churches in New England. And you mentioned that you are willing to be a, some kind of consultant and to, to help best you can. But take a moment and just provide us some summary um, statements and guidelines regarding, again, desanitizing, that's your area, and, and, and Ruth, how can we prevent the spread of diseases as we seek to open up our churches in the near future? Okay, so um, um, if you could put this, I don't know if you could still put the slide up of the uh, of the trifold that we, we spoke about earlier, uh, but, uh, we are a faith-based ministry. Uh, we are here to help people who are, are struggling with life controlling issues. Um, we have been in existence for 61 years. Our New York office has uh, been here for 31 years. We are the corporate office for New York Adult and Teen Challenge. And um, if you have someone who's struggling, it's a free program. Um, it's an inpatient program. They come to us, they live with us. And our, our focus and our goal is to get them stable and to give them a different way to, to approach life, to look at life, and to, uh, you know, we are rooted in the Word of God. We are not the typical disease mentality where we feel like it's an incurable disease. Uh, we know that, that we were designed for much better. Um, we, are, we are including this trifold in this so that if you have anyone in your, your church that is struggling with addiction, whether it be gambling, whether it be drugs, alcohol, whatever the case may be, life controlling issues, the common denominator in any life controlling issue is sin. So we all have a problem with that and how we react to that, is, is, it comes out in different ways. As far as our, our, our offices, we have offices in, in uh, Buffalo, we have offices in Syracuse, offices in Albany. Um, we are the corporate office here. We also have a satellite office in Rochester. So anyone who is, is, at, is in a place in those areas, if they need help, uh, contact us and we will do our best to see if we can, uh, can, can um, you know, make the connection with you guys. Um, the goal here is to make sure that, you know, we are aware of, of the transmission of this disease and how it happens. Um, cleaning your church in the beginning of service does not suffice if you're gonna have multiple services because you're gonna have to clean it again once that area has been contaminated and the 
first person that comes into the room in your church, you need to consider that now your building is contaminated again. So your procedures need to start over again. Um, so that is very, very important. That is why we focus on our church community because we have the manpower and the strength to come in and do it um, with the speed that it needs to be done. And, uh, you know, we, we ha we've had some success with it. Um, as, as you said, uh, Dr. Joseph, we did go out and do one of the churches uh, this week. Um, it was great. And we were able to kind of educate the staff while we were there on things to do. And they were very receptive. Um, and, and we were really happy to be in that position. Thank you, Brian. So my closing remarks are this. We have to take this virus seriously. Uh, the uh, rapid transmission occurred because people did not initially take the virus seriously and, and just thought it was just like the flu. And one of the things that I want to say is that, that our word, the, our, Jesus just covers us and he cleanses us. And that's how we're transformed and become new creations. Well, we wanna make sure that we are living in the word of the Lord. And one of the things to live in the word of the Lord is, is to certainly sanitize and disinfect because we need to be clean. Jesus isn't gonna come and clean the church. He's just gonna instill in us the uh, awareness and the wisdom of what to do. So through uh, our diligence, we can worship together and there's nothing more important than being together as, as the church, we are the church and certainly spreading the word of sanitation and disinfecting out in our communities. I mean, I, I work primarily in nursing homes and it's, it's been my uh, number one uh, area of weakness. And uh, I don't always, I wish I had Brian with me all the time, but you know, Brian is a teen challenge and uh, uh, most facilities have their own uh, housekeeping and, it, and it's very frustrating because disinfection and sanitation is number one, but then we are the contaminants. So we have to make sure that in conjunction with the sanitation and the disinfection that we're doing our part. The hand sanitation, using the, the disinfectant wipes, making sure that we are responsible and accountable and wearing a mask and practicing the social distancing. This virus, we don't know what's gonna happen. They're saying we could have a surge. I, I don't know what that is. And I, I do believe that God is in control at all times and that it's in his hands. So as a praying woman, I just pray that we just remain safe but do everything that we possibly can to enforce that safety. So I thank you all, and I keep all of our churches deep in prayer in my heart, and thank you so much. You can email me if you have any uh, questions specific that you didn't want to ask online. I'll be happy to, to uh, email you back or text me as well. Thank you. Ruth, Ruth um, there's a question, and, and, and Brian as well, but Ruth, I think this more comes under you. Um, there are churches that rent space to other churches that worship on Sunday. And we rent from other churches as well, where we don't have an actual building that we own in some cases. And somebody here is asking a question, how can we ensure protocols are adhered to in cases where we rent space and where we rent, where we rent to others and where we rent from other denominations? How can you answer that question? That's, right. that's a good question. Uh, you know, we have um, we have one church that's in a movie theater. Um, of course, most of the theaters are closed down now, but um, that would be a perfect example of someone who is renting space from, um, you know, someone else. So you have to own the protocol. Um, if you're going into a building, um, I would strongly suggest that you communicate with whoever uh, is is uh, is involved in the cleaning of that building to make sure that you're all on the same team and that you're aware of what was done and what wasn't done. Um, I would I would handle every situation as if we have to do it to protect our people, and um, because you just don't want it to be something that was assumed. We don't have that luxury. So you have to own it. If you're renting space from someone, then you should be uh, considering, um, you know, what it takes to clean that building for our folks. And, and if they have a service after yours or something like that, um, you know, maybe you guys could communicate about what makes sense uh, and collaborating together with that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. That if you're renting a space, there has to be active communication and an agreement uh, for what, what the conditions are to rent that space. 
it would be wonderful if they were providing the sanitation. That's not always going to happen. You may have to take on that responsibility. I want to give a shout out to Grafton. I feel he was once a nurse who worked under me when I was the director of nursing. It is amazing. Uh, God puts all people together. So hi, Grafton. But and he did. He was my infection control nurse, as a matter of fact. But um, you know, God is good. I think responsibility and accountability is the word. Whether you're renting, whether you own the church, whether you're just having church at home, or you know, we're we're all people of God, and we we all want to make sure that we're in one accord. That's so important that you have that agreement ahead of time, so you know uh, what your responsibilities are. And don't just expect that because you rent, they're going to keep it clean. It may not happen. Wonderful, and, and Grafton is the first <laughs> elder. Grafton, I feel the first elder of New Jerusalem on Long Island. How do you like that? Really a, really a small world, and he's surprised to see you, and you're surprised to see him. We are connected in so many different ways. Well, right? we all are connected, that's for sure, through Jesus. Right. Well, Northeastern, as we wrap it up, we, we trust that we have provided you with some hood of helps that you can, with confidence, begin to reopen your church. At the Village Church, we opened up yesterday with our first uh, in-person board meeting and vision planning meeting with social distancing, and we had a wonderful experience in our new building last evening. We are not to be afraid. Uh, we have to be careful, but not afraid. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but we need to be very cautious and take all the steps we need to take as we, you heard last week and today to ensure that we do it in the right way and we continue to do so so that we are safe and that our people also are safe. I want to take a moment before Pastor Laguerre prays for us as we conclude this because he worked with me quite closely to uh, prepare the, the program for last week's Sabbath at camp meeting and today but I want to acknowledge the, the ad hoc committee that really worked with me to put together the Northeastern plan. Uh, let me shout out uh, uh, Pastor Amanda Hawley, Pastor Omar Jarvis, Pastor Legge, who is here, Dr. Alan Martin, Pastor Hector Ramos, Dr. Warner Richards, Pastor Marco Seifert, Pastor Rohan Spencer, Dr. Uh, Jaffe, Robert, St. Louis, they worked with me to put together the plan, and it was a lot of work, great team. I also want to uh, shout out to Sister Jeanine Lendo, a communications person in the president's office, and even right now she's with us, uh, working behind the scenes, and she was the one managing the questions. I want to shout out Gary uh, of Praise Vision and JJ. JJ is right here holding up the, the, the StreamYard platform, the platform for today. And then uh, I want to also, uh, again, thank those who served last week, uh, Drs. Uh, Alexander and Dr. Bizarro, uh, Sister Barbara Hall, and special thanks to our administrators, Dr. Daniel Honorary, our president, Dr. UL Oswald UL, our secretary, and uh, Ella Robert Chandler, our treasurer. These individuals have provided tremendous support as we work hard to try to come up with a plan and to give direction to our churches to open up effectively and with efficiency and, and with safety. So thanks to all of you and those of you who attended, we thank you. We shall be providing a certificate to all the, the registered delegates and churches from which they came for the training they took today and also on last week at camp meeting. May God bless you all. Pastor Laguerre will come and give us our Part and prayer and blessing, and again, God bless you and keep you and all of our churches as we open up to the honor and glory and praise of his name. Ruth and Brian, once again, receive my profound, my profound thanks and appreciation for what you have done for us today. Pastor, let's begin. Yeah, let us pray. Oh, Father in heaven, as your church is nearing home, as we approach the border of heaven and Canaan, Father, we are seeing situation never encountered before. So remind us that he who watches over Israel never slumbers nor sleeps. May your church <laughs> 
your church leaders, our church members, continue to stand on all the promises you've made to your people. As we navigate life, remind us, O oh God, that the fiery serpents of COVID are under your ultimate control. Give wisdom to local church leadership so that they may act as responsible leaders. May we interact in mutual submission as well. Uh, precede your people as they are ready to enter, re enter the buildings, the sanctuaries. Cover your deacons and deaconesses, the pastors and the the, the musicians, the priest team leaders and the priest team members, our children, whoever will decide to enter the sacred places as they enter after they have done everything in the power. Father, take, take over the whole system. May your church continue to be, uh, and give access rather to life. We do not want it to be a cause of death and miseries. Forgive our sins. Remind us that soon and very soon we are going to see the King. May we continue to operate within the belief that Jesus is coming back soon. May, you, may, may evangelism continue to be our modus operandi may your church be filled with the spirit may we accomplish our mission may our lives be transformed uh, by the holy spirit and after everything will be said and done may we all meet by the throne of god your throne and enter canons where there will be no more sickness no more dying, no more suffering, no more COVID, no more AIDS, no more illnesses and disease. Thank you, Father. Keep us safely and bless each one of us. Bless each church in particular, in every single state. <laughs> May we serve you faithfully till Christ returns, for we pray in the precious and holy name of our Savior and Lord Christ. Amen. Amen. Before we go, uh, let me also, Mrs. Juna Boutros is, is my dedicated and efficient admin assistant. She will be sending out to you uh, sometime this week all the details from last week's training and today's training. And again, we need to uh, uh, salute Sister Boutras for her hard work. Again, God bless you all, and we will see you soon. Open up your churches and give God praise and glory and honor. Thank you very much. God bless you.